Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us on a Friday afternoon. This has been a very, very uh, fun summer for both Kurt and I. We really enjoyed the opportunity to share uh, the ADAS trainings with you, and I hope that uh, you have enjoyed them as well. We're going to miss you, so we have some ideas of how we can continue um, the training conversation and uh, communications regarding everything that's going on in the world of transportation. So in terms of um, the future, uh, we've been talking about offering at some point in the next semester or so, uh, in-person uh, calibration training. And Kurt's gonna talk about that uh, at the end of today's session, but I just wanna let you know that that's something that we're thinking about putting together. I'm also exploring a couple of other ideas with a number of other vendors, but um, I'll keep you informed as those things develop and as COVID diminishes, how's that? Uh, in terms of uh, my sector, the advanced transportation sector, I'll also be sending out uh, invitations for trainings and other webinars uh, that we are sponsoring with clean cities that affect uh, all the transportation modes in the Bay Area. And also for the diesel programs, because I'm working with them on heavy duty electric training right now and working with uh, doing some adult ed or a contract training with some of the fleets. And that's something that some of the automotive faculty might be interested in, so I'll keep you all informed about those as they developed. In terms of uh, the surveys, I haven't gotten a lot of surveys back. I've gotten a handful. Uh, I would really appreciate if you spend just a couple of moments uh, and let me know what your thoughts are for your training needs going forward. Uh, without your input, it's difficult for me to uh, develop those and implement uh, for you. Uh, but especially during uh, these COVID-19 days, I know you're all overwhelmed. But a Friday afternoon with your friends might be a good way to get a little relaxation time and training hours in. Uh, speaking of training hours, I sent out the uh, template that I'm going to be using for your training certificates. So after today's training, I'll be uh, finalizing your training hours. So for each of you, I will be putting together one of those training certificates with the number of hours uh, that you were shown to have participated in according to the usage reports that Zoom uh, produces. I'm kind of averaging about two hours a session for folks. And if you were on the call for like um, 100 minutes, I'm giving you credit for 120. So that's basically gonna go out in the next week or two. And then for the Bay Area College faculty, I'm working with your uh, deans and SWP rep uh, to put together your stipend for this training period. So that's happening, but we all know that goes a little slowly. So don't spend it yet. And in, the last thing I wanna talk about real quickly is um, I have a little advertising money for the automotive sector. And I've been talking to a couple of you regarding what would be the most effective use of any kind of marketing or advertising money. And I've been meeting also with um, a small advertising agency that does a lot of college related advertising and marketing. And I'm working with them on a bid, but I will probably delay any kind of advertising until COVID kind of quiets down because things are just so volatile right now with COVID. We have no idea where enrollments are and whether or not advertising dollars would be effective during this kind of period. And secondly, this is supposed to be tied to the ADAS curriculum uh, being utilized in the classroom because we want potential students to know that our curriculum is changing and incorporating uh, the more advanced connected systems in the cars. That way we can not only educate and inform uh, parents, counselors, and potential students about the changes we're making, but we might also attract students from other pathways, you know, engineering and IT students as well. So I'm looking at possibly a spring semester for that, but I'll keep you all informed as that goes along. I might ask some of you to take a look at some of the videos that we're creating. They would, the media for that would be placed on social media stations like uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, et cetera. That's ongoing. Um, but that's it for me. If you have any ideas or suggestions, please, please uh, let me know what you need. 
and get in contact. And I also suggest the high school faculty, please keep in touch as well. We don't want to lose contact with you, especially um, during these very uncertain times. It'd be really good to keep that communication strong and healthy. But now here we are. Hi, uh, David Ames had something. Yeah, uh, Pam, I just wanted to know. Um, oh, David, I'm sorry. Uh, if, if we could send a flyer out to the body shops. They're the ones that really pushed us to put that program together in the first place. And um, a lot of their people need training. So Great. that's a suggestion. No, David, that's uh, actually very consistent with our thoughts regarding the independent garages because they too have approached me about uh, working with them on ADAS and training their techs. So that's something that each campus can think about and maybe we can put together. In fact, Kurt and I have been talking about that special trainings for them. Some, I might get funding for some of it, but some of the body shops I've spoken to said they'd be, they would be willing to actually invest in those trainings and spend the money. Um, but we'll see. But David, we'll work on that. Thank okay. you. So Kurt, thank you so much. I wanted to acknowledge Kurt before the actual session today because I know some of you leave before the final goodbyes, but I just wanted to acknowledge Kurt's hard work when we talked about this year and a half ago, I certainly did not expect it to evolve to where it is today. And that is because of Kurt. Kurt took a couple of suggestions and some input and just ran with it. And I think the world of Kurt and I think the entire region is so lucky to have uh, someone like Kurt take up the leadership reins and just run with it. And all of you benefit. So Kurt, thank you. Thanks Pam, thanks everybody. All right, so we ready? It's Friday, we got something uh, uh, not new to talk about, but uh, rather timely because, you know, programming's not new. Uh, I was with Volvo in the late 90s when we started doing programming in the dealerships. And, you know, it's kind of always been there and, and shops have varying levels of application. You know, the dealers, it's pretty much standard practice. Uh, the independents, it's kind of 50-50. Some will touch it, some will have somebody come in, or some will just send it off to the dealership. Um, but, you know, as we talk more with our ADAS and, and more with body electronics and, you know, the EVs and just everything going forward, programming takes in a bigger and bigger piece. Uh, so, in my opinion, it, it, it always fit. Um, that and the vehicle communications is the reason I built in these last two that were not your typical ADAS kind of stuff. Uh, I was telling Pam before, I've had all kinds of weird stuff going on this week and changed out some monitors and stuff. So if things crash and burn in the middle of it, I'll get it back as quick as I can, but you never know. So let's move forward with this. So seminar nine of vehicle programming. So same as always, uh, try to throw the questions at the chat. We'll hit them as we go. Not a deep dive, not trying to certify anybody. And again, your screen, you might have to tweak it because I did everything in widescreen so you can see more. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about vehicle programming, what, why, how, and some problems. Uh, obviously, Q and A's, and we'll have a little conversation on the future projects discussion. That's gonna be uh, really, really important. So try not to bail late. Uh, you wanna be part of that discussion. I finally updated that screen. So if you actually do go to the ATL page, uh, that's what it looks like. And all of these videos, as well as the PowerPoints, go up there. I send them right after it. I know Pam sends it almost right after it. And I think it's usually there by Friday night. If not, it's definitely there by Monday morning. Uh, Jill's amazing with that. And, you know, quite honestly, this gives you something to use in your classroom. You know, last week we said, hey, what are you going to bring into your classes? I mean, you can use these presentations. You can cut them up. Heck, you can run the video if you wanted to. Uh, sign that as a, an online uh, lab task or something. Uh, it just, again, the more we can expose, the sooner we can expose, the better the off they'll be along with our industry. So what's programming? Well, ultimately it's the act of installing a new or an updated set of directions into a computer or module. Those get used interchangeably. And it might be a complete set of directions where they've completely erased it and put everything new. Uh, it might be just a patch or just a short edit to code that they do to do a correction. Uh, might be done via a hardwire electrical connection. It could even be done by Wi-Fi, cellular, or even a USB. 
It really depends on what is being updated, who the manufacturer is, how big the file is, all that kind of fun fill stuff. So why are we programming? Well, typically it's to provide a correction or to add additional features. Now, probably more commonly is we've replaced a module and we need that module to now work. Uh, in most cases, if I install a new module, it's kind of a dumb box. It might know it's an engine management module, but not know what to do, how to do it, or what it's in. It just knows its name is ECU. So it depends on the application. Have we had programming for a while? Yeah, earlier systems, they used uh, computers and they had the software, the program on that computer and it was loaded into what was called an EEPROM, electronically programmable read-only memory. And the only way you could change that was to chip it. So we remember that in the 80s, hey, I chipped my car. Well, you took that chip out and you put a new chip in with new software because they really didn't have the capacity to have an update done. As we got later, late 90s, early 2000s, they changed that processor to an EEPROM, electronically erasable programmable read-only memory, which now gave them the ability to go in there and erase the software and install new. And that changed everything because now you weren't doing hardware replacements, you could start making serious changes to the vehicle, you could add features, all kinds of different things, because now we could load the software in that we needed to do. So programming started to really change the landscape. What are some of the benefits? Well, we can make repairs related to software errors, just like your cell phone, your PC, nowadays your telephones, uh, your TVs, your toaster, whatever. Uh, if it's got a problem, it's probably going to get fixed with a software update. So we can update software. We can also start to reduce costs because previously when you didn't even have a replaceable chip, the chip was soldered to the board, you had to replace that whole module. So now the shops had to stock multiple modules and for multiple vehicles and multiple applications and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden you have thousands of modules to cover a few years worth of cars. Whereas by having the ability to program, we could now take a dumb box and tell it what to do, how to do it, what it's installed in and the details of it. And all of a sudden we started reducing inventories. It also gave us some capacities to upgrade or add functions and features. So a lot of companies now, your car has that nav display even though you didn't buy navigation. But for a few thousand dollars and you buy the map and you buy the, uh, the accessory code and they now program it into your car and load the maps and now you have navigation. It wasn't a hardware based change, it was purely a software feature. So now they could start to update things or improve their product even after the fact. So it started to open up more and more windows for us. And like I mentioned before, reduction in inventory and you know, maybe the matrix had it right, you know, being able to plug something in and wake up and I know Kung Fu. So that'd be cool. So how do we program? Well, depends on the environment. If you're working in the dealership, you're probably using the factory whatever, whether it's a PC or other special tool. If we're in the aftermarket, we've usually got that third party device, and I always forget the J whatever numbers, but that third party device that works as an interface to where we can bring down the software package into a laptop. The laptop is then gonna transfer it through that interface into the vehicle and perform that programming function. It's a little different than the dealers, um, tends to be a lot slower. Uh, there's some costs involved with it and, and a lot of hope and prayer. At the dealer level, it's a much smoother, much more seamless process for the typical programming. But now we're starting to see over the air programming come into play. Tesla has been really big on over the air. And we've also seen a few manufacturers in the last few years where they'll have some update capacity using a USB to where software will come down from the internet, 
go into a, a blank USB, it loads into an accessory port in the vehicle, and then it can do updates, whether it's mapping or certain features, uh, depending on the vehicle. So there's a few different ways that they can do this stuff um, to, you know, continue to make it viable. So if we're gonna talk about programming, we've gotta talk about buses because buses is really what's allowed us to do programming on cars. So we've gotta start there. And again, this fits with everything we're hearing back from people and industry and everything else. Buses, buses, buses. We gotta get back into thinking buses big time. So here's our bus. This happens to be out of a BMW off the internet. All right, not using any factory stuff. This is stuff you can find through a Google search. You can find these things um, in ShopKey and all data and all that kind of stuff. So when we look at this, what we've got up here, and we'll see if we can get a cursor going here. Up in here is where our OBD2 connector is going to be or our DLC. So yeah, you have all those standardized pins and this is a late enough model vehicle. I believe it's a 2018. And this one also has ethernet, which is quite commonplace in a lot of vehicles now. And we've got our diagnostic can, which you've seen on a lot of vehicles. Now that OBD2 connection is gonna go into what's called the gateway module. And pretty much every car out there has some sort of a gateway module. Think of the gateway module as a lot like a switch or a router in a computer network. Its job is to check who's coming in the door, identify, is this a factory tool or an aftermarket tool? Because we're gonna treat them differently. It's also gonna decide what communications can come in and what communications can go out. And oh, by the way, we also need to be able to change languages and change speeds. Because all these different networks speak a different language, talk at different speeds. And we've gotta be able to move this information through that in whatever language and whatever speed it is. So what we've also got on here is basically there's four different versions of bus and I'm lumping them together. We have multiple can type buses in here. We have a flex ray, think can on steroids. Ethernet, not that different than the networking in your office building or the network in your house. We have a LIN bus, which is the only single wire bus in the, in the lot, but a ton of cars are gone to LIN now. And then we have a MOST bus, which is actually a fiber optic bus uh, that have been used for quite some time for the entertainment side of things. So when we go to program, what's happening is our computer is out here connecting through the OBD2. And let's say we're going to program something that's over in this area that's connected to the Ethernet. Well, that program is going to pass through that gateway module. It'll be recognized. It'll be approved and it will make its way along that network. And because every module has its own individual name or network ID or node, it knows exactly who to go to. And then it will go about doing whatever it's told to do. So if it's just add something, it will add that line of code. If it's told to erase what's there and put something new in, it will do that. But it's only gonna go to that one. Now, is it flying around that whole bus? Yes, everybody sees it. Think of the mail at your house. The, if you're at the last house on the street, does your mail go to every single house? Yes, it does. The mailman walks up to every single house, but it only gets delivered to your house because your house has the correct address. So that same thing is happening with the programming. When we go to install a program, everybody ignores it except for who it's meant to do. So in this case, it's going over an ethernet. Why ethernet? Well, because it's fast. It's faster for programming stuff than basically anything else we have on there. So we've got that flying by there, but we've also got other bus types. So we've got flex ray. So again, think really fast um, CAN bus and it's buzzing into certain modules. A lot of the time it's powertrain and suspension related. So it's very fast, very reactive. We've got PT cans that are going into things from instrument clusters to, you know, door modules and such. And then we've got, you know, the lowly LIN bus that's, you know, doing our battery module and things like that, or alternators, et cetera. So that's just to kind of give you an idea. And I just 
take a look up there and I saw David ask, isn't there five bus types? Yeah, there, probably, there is more bus types. We've got M buses and a bunch of other things. But on this diagram, there's really only four different types of bus. There's variations of the CAN in there, you know, CAN 1, CAN 2, CAN 3, CAN 4, and things like that. Um, a flex ray, Ethernet, LIN, and a most. So that's just on this diagram, but there are more buses depending on the vehicle. Okay. Now, some of the vehicles, when you got into some of the older cars, in some cases, the most bus, again, this is a fiber optic bus. It's not electric, it's a little flashing light. And we're moving data literally at the speed of light. Um, think Morse code, all right? Flash that light on and off really fast and it moves the data. In some cases, you would actually, through your programming unit, tap right into that MOS bus. And the MOS bus is a series circuit, essentially. And you would tap right into that. And you could program directly into those modules over the most. At the same time, it was programming something over a CAN bus. And what that gave is speed. Because typically, those modules on the most were entertainment, entertainment related. And they took a lot of data. They would take a long time to program. So having the ability to program in two tracks at the same time sped up that process. I know with BMW, when we started getting really aggressive in programming around 2002, we would see some cars, it would, it would tell us 20 hours of programming, 24 hours of programming. And it was like, okay, it's going to crash four times before it does that. Now that same car, well, not that same car, newer technology car, uh, with more modules might do the whole car in an hour because of the ethernet and higher communication rates and things like that. So the bus is a good uh, foundation point to understand how we're dispersing that information. You know, many of the cars that come into your shop require reprogramming, don't they? Are you doing that? Odds are you're not, if you're like most of the shops that we've talked to, you still haven't jumped off the fence and started reprogramming in-house. Instead, you're choosing to send your money down the street to the local dealer or to that specialist that comes to your shop to do it for you. The reason most tell us that we don't do reprogramming in our shops is because it's too complicated, it's too costly, and a lot of other myths that we hope to dispel in this edition of The Trainer. You know, on the surface, reprogramming seems to be a pretty complicated task to many technicians, but to tell you the truth, it's really not that hard. There are some basic things, though, that you have to keep in mind to keep yourself out of trouble, and it's a lot easier to start on the manufacturer lines that tend to be a little more technician-friendly before you start moving into those that aren't so friendly. GM, for example, has long been known as a platform that's not too bad when you start getting used to the programming functions as compared to, say, Mercedes-Benz. But to get more information on those fundamentals and to keep yourself out of trouble as you step into the waters of reprogramming, I've asked my buddy Dave Cox over at Drew Technologies to lend a hand and his expertise to today's topic. So let's turn it over, Dave. Tell us a little bit about what we need to watch out for as we dive into the world of reprogramming. Hey, thanks, Pete. My name is Dave and I'm with the Drew Technology support team. Today I would like to talk to you about reprogramming. Reprogramming seems to be a scary topic for some shops today. As Pete already mentioned, we are talking about computers, interfaces, and the heart of today's vehicles, electronic control modules. But following a few simple rules when performing a reprogram will keep your concerns to a minimum and allow your shop to keep the job in-house. Let's head over to our toolbox and take a look at the hardware you'll need to perform reprogramming in your shop. So what will you need to start reprogramming in your shop? First off, you'll need a J2534 interface, such as the Drew Technologies Cardac Plus 2. A laptop with a power supply that meets the OEM specifications. A battery maintainer, a stable, high-speed internet connection, 
and of course an active subscription to the OEM you are wanting to program. So let's head over to the vehicle and talk about some important points to remember during the reprogramming process. Some important points to remember when reprogramming to keep failures and errors out of the picture. Never reprogram a module unless you're directed to do so by a TSB or service information for a particular concern. Having service information is a must. The service information will allow you to see all the steps you need to perform during the process. Sometimes when replacing a module, there are additional setup steps that you will need to perform after the reprogramming is complete. And having this information available to you before you start can save you a lot of time in the long run. As I mentioned earlier, always use a battery maintainer. Proper battery voltage is so critical when reprogramming. This will help you eliminate errors or the possibility of the OEM software shutting down because the battery voltage gets too low. Always use an AC adapter with your laptop. Please don't run the risk of the battery going dead on the laptop during the reprogramming as this will also cause errors and failures. Finally, disable any screen savers, sleep function, or antivirus program you may be running on your PC. All of these can interfere with the overall process and again cause failures, errors, and more headaches and trouble for your shop down the line. As you can see, following a few simple rules will help you with the reprogramming process and allow your shop to complete the job efficiently and effectively. Well, Pete, I need to get back to reprogramming this module. Thanks for stopping by Drew Technologies. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience and knowledge with us. Guys, if you have any questions and you want to know more about how you can dive into the world of reprogramming, the guys at Drew Technologies are certainly among the many sources that you can ask. So give them a call. You'll find the website listed in the description here at the end of the video. And talking about the end of the video, that's all the time we got for this edition of The Trainer. I'll see you next month. Okay, so it kind of gave us a quick overview on some of the important things, and we're going to go a little deeper as we go with these. So, first thing we got to start with, what's a computer or a module? Well, basically, it's a device that's going to control outputs based on information from sensors and other inputs and operational directions. It's going to utilize software, otherwise known as programs, to perform the functions that can be compared to thinking in humans. So this whole thing is a loop process. The switch, the sensor, whatever it might be that provides that input, it goes into the module, the module thinks about it, and it looks at its book of rules. Okay, and that's what you really want to think of the program as. It's a book of rules, and we'll talk more about that. And based on that decision, it's going to control an output, run a motor, activate a fuel injector, whatever the case may be. What's a program? Well, a program is a written set of directions that the computer uses to function. It tells it what to do, when to do it, and how to do something. Remember, the computer itself is basically a dumb box. It might know it's an uh, engine control unit, but it doesn't know how to do anything. It doesn't know what vehicle it's in or anything like that. Program is also referred to as code. And there are a lot of different program languages no, I have absolutely no idea what language the auto manufacturers use. Who cares? <laughs> but it is code. And when you look at code, it's a series of, you know, sentences, individual sentences, not even paragraphs, where you'll see letters, symbols, numbers, all kinds of gobbledygook that basically says, do this when you see that. It's just how that computer's written to do it. Now, who's going to create this stuff? Well, excuse me. Uh, stay with the program here real quick. Uh, again, it is written lines. Any error in any of those lines, even one symbol being incorrect, could screw up the operation. So just that one slight misspelling, let's say, can keep something from working the way it should. The other side of programming, we have what's called encoding. 
Now, encoding is different than a program. A program tells it what to do and how to do it. Encoding is involved with providing application or let's say in our case, vehicle details. And we've all dealt with encoding. Every time you buy a new electronic device, what does it ask you to do? What language, what time zone, those kinds of things. That is encoding. It knows every language, it knows every time zone, you have to tell it which one is applicable to that application. So if I'm programming an ECU, I've installed the software for it to do all of its work, and now I have to tell it the vehicle specifics. Hey, it's left-hand drive, it's an automatic transmission, it's a V8 with air conditioning, and so on and so on and so on. Without that specific information, it doesn't know how to control that vehicle because it says, is, are you a four cylinder, a six cylinder, a 10, a 12, what are you? So it can't function without that next level of information, okay? And we're all used to that. We've all had to set that up on electronic devices constantly. Those two work together. I install the program and then I encode. Even if I only program one module, I might encode the entire car because maybe there's something in that program that has made a slight change and I need the rest of the car to know that. So those two go together. Now, there are times I might only encode. Maybe something wasn't turned on or identified correctly and I would just go in and encode the vehicle. But if I program, I always encode. But if I encode, that doesn't always mean I've had to program. Encryption, and this is the, the big, ugly, scary monster, especially as we go more towards autonomous and stuff. Right now, car manufacturers encryption is actually quite high. Everything can be hacked. We know that it's just a matter of time, but you don't hear a lot of car stuff being hacked. It, it's not always worth the effort. And now with so many things, so many overlays, it's getting a little more complex, even for a tuner to go in there and change how something reacts. They, you know, used to be give it more fuel, shift later and harder, and you know, advance the timing. Well, now they got to play with cam timing. Now they got to play with valve lift. Now they got to play with controlling these other things, and that gets more complex than just bumping up numbers in certain pits. So with encryption. The key is it's critical throughout the supply chain. So the company that's making the chip itself has to have high security levels because one of the things that's embedded on all the chips is a certain level of, of operating stuff. Uh, a lot of the time they call the BIOS and things like that. So that basic operating stuff is on the chip real early in the process. So if the company that makes the chip isn't securing it, it's got that vulnerability throughout the process. So every step of the way from that chip being manufactured to the point where it's in your car and coming into your shop, that security has to be in place. Otherwise, there's those vulnerabilities. Even when they go to program, there's usually an authentication process so that as you connect up to the vehicle, the vehicle recognizes that this is an approved software package and an authorized software package to come in and then allow it to do whatever process it's being requested of. Now, they talk about cryptographic security, and it's a fancy word for a whole lot of mathematical algorithms. You know, you hear of 128-bit protections. Well, 128-bit protections is basically that password has 128 things in it. The more things you got, the harder it is to hack because there's just that many more options or that many more chances for there to be a code. So more and more, we're seeing higher levels of encryption. The sad part is there's really no industry standard at this time, which is probably a good thing. Because if there was an industry standard and everybody knew what the one thing that everybody had was, there'd be probably a higher susceptibility to having it hacked. Now, how do they know uh, where these things could come from. Well, that's where they start looking in this lower chart. Attack vectors. How can software get into the vehicle? Well, we know the cellular is connected into the car. Bluetooth is going to connect into the car. I don't know what GNSS is, 
The satellite's going to communicate with the vehicle. FM radio is a lot harder for it to bring something in. Sensors, possibly. Wi-Fi, definitely. And then you go, well, tire pressure monitoring. Well, yeah, tire pressure monitoring speaks over a radio signal and it goes into a module. So that's a susceptibility. So you can see where some of these things, that's a way in to the vehicle from the outside. From the inside, we start looking at, hey, through the CAN bus, through the ethernet, through the MOST bus and things like that. So the, the buses that are there through our OBD2 connector, through the USB ports. So anywhere that software could come into the network from internal or external things become security chances. And they are working feverishly on this. Have there been, oh, I just saw Paul, so GNS, Global Navigation System. Thank you. So I had no idea. And I also didn't look. <laughs> Um, but we've all seen on the internet a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, a Chrysler or Dodge Durango or something like that. And they turned it off. They hacked the guy's brakes and turned the brakes off in a parking lot or whatever. And the other radio all freaked out. And at the end of the video, they said, well, yeah, we had the car the day before and loaded software in it that created the vulnerability. And that's the bigger key is the car driving down the roads, probably not going to get hacked. The car that's been in a service facility and had something installed into it, now it has the potential. You've created that window. That's where they're starting to focus a lot of stuff is, hey, how do I make sure that that USB can't do something if the key's off or the key's on or it's left in, things like that. And we saw that on a, on a new Supra one time that uh, the car was very proactive because it had something plugged in and it said, no, 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 you can't do this. Um, it made us unplug it. So those things are already in place. All right, so let's hit some questions here because that was a, a mouthful and then some. Okay. John Taylor, I miss the good old days of replacing physical problems. <laughs> that was a little simpler. Uh, uh, Rick's got an internet problem. Let's see here. Paul Elwin, I heard the top, the laptop has to be set up with operating system Windows 7, the virus protection turned off, and sleep mode. Uh, it depends on what you're using. Um, yeah, most of them seem to be PC-based more than Mac. Um, I don't know why. I think a lot of people in the industry, it's become pretty much PC-based more than Mac-based. Uh, yes, it's quite common to see when you're doing programming, even sometimes installing programs in your own computer. So you remember, you're going to a manufactured website, you're downloading a certain program. Uh, sometimes the, the antivirus is going to say, no, 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 this doesn't look right. So oftentimes that's just to be able to pull it down into your own machine. Uh, the sleep mode definitely, because they don't want the, the drives to stop spinning while it's in the process of loading that software. Uh, David's question uh, five bus types, yeah, we talked about, it was just the four different variations on that particular diagram. Um, there's probably, I think there's even more than five because I got two or three more in my head. Uh, Mark, the bar iOS uh, knows what the original coding and programming for the ECM PCM is. And if a customer has reprogrammed the module, they will fail that part of the smog test. Uh, it can, it can, it, it depends on how current the bar system is. Uh, the, the car manufacturers, they can get ahead of the bar and stuff sometimes and, and bar won't know the difference. Uh, in the dealer, one of the things you run into though is you get cars that come in and, and they've had a reflash and the factory stuff won't recognize it. And it'll say, whoa, 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 whoa. Or it'll say, no problem, I'm gonna load my new campaign software and that you know 50 horsepower increase that the customer paid for for the third party reflash is now gone. So you see that come into play as well. Uh, but yeah, some of the systems can, can recognize the bogus programming and some of the really good programming, they don't always recognize. And the other thing that comes into play with a lot of people with performance changes is they've, in some cases, they've gone away from reprogramming the module just for that reason. And what they're doing is they're putting the piggybacks in. So essentially they've got a little module that goes in between the engine harness and the computer and it lies to the computer. 
So that way, when you connect up to the vehicle, you see the original PCM and all the original data set, but the controlling going out has been modified based on a modified input from the piggyback. And those are basically invisible other than for a visual. Um, let's see here, Josh, Mark, that would be something that is tuned, right? Yeah, if you've reflashed. Uh, Paul had the GNSS global navigation system. Um, Robin chimed in global navigation satellite system. Ed Snyder, uh, are there still some issues with having to replace additional modules during a program update due to modules not being able to take the software update? Yeah, we're going to touch a little deeper on that. What we saw when we first started seeing reprogramming become commonplace in the early to mid 2000s, the modules were built with a certain amount of memory capacity on that chip. And what happened is, is we experienced it with BMW, the cars would come in and they were getting so many software updates that two things, one of two things were happening. One, the chip didn't have enough space on it for the new software and you had to replace it to then load it. Or two, a lot of those early chips had a reflash um, lifespan to where they would say, hey, you can only reflash this a dozen times and then you have to replace it because they were worried about hardware degradation. As electronics improved, as time went by, a lot of those, uh, you know, flash cycle counters went away and, and many of them have gone fairly infinite or into the hundreds and in some cases thousands. So it's not as apt to run into play, but that's something that as you're going through your programming setup and process, one of the things at least the factory equipment will do is it will tell you, hey, you got to replace the module before we can program it. We can't update that hardware. Okay. Um, Mark, at the dealer, we red flag cars and their warranty would be affected. Yeah. Um, a lot of manufacturers will go in there and if they've been flashed, um, they'll, they'll pull the part, let's say the powertrain warranty off of it. The rock and hard place is, is what if your dealership sold that aftermarket upgrade? You know, a lot of the car companies have partner, let's say Ford and Shelby stuff. You know, if they did a, a Jack Roush or a Shelby or whoever's uh, reflash, you sold that to that customer. And now you're taking it out to do the campaign stuff. And now the guy's going to lose his warranty. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of touchy ground with some of that, even though a lot of the big name reflash companies or providers like a Roush and what have you, they've, they'll warranty it if it breaks it even though Ford might not. So there's a whole lot of stuff that comes into play with those. Uh, does the DLC connector, the second part of his question, does the DLC connector have an Ethernet, Ethernet, Ethernet line? Yes, but it's not five wires or six wires like you see in the Cat5, Cat6 cables. A lot of them are just two wires in that connector that it's talking over. So it's just using two more of the, of the 17 that usually aren't used. And they do have a fixed, no, uh, fixed point that they go into. So they're the same for every car. Kaylin, the bar knows if you've been switching back and forth uh, with performance software. You know, I'm not sure. Um, I think the only way they would know is if at some point in time it recognized the, the program stuff. And so I, I don't know how, how they could tell if it's not in there when I don't, you know, if I take it out before I do it, then it'd be hard for them to see, I think, but I don't know. Uh, Mark, Audi has stasis and we flashed lots of modules. Later, Audi wouldn't mon uh, warranty the flashes and it was a real mess. Exactly. And that's the scenario I was bringing up. Uh, with BMW, it's Dynan. A lot of the BMW dealers sold Dynan products and Dynan had a reflash, but if there was a campaign or a recall, and you reflash that module, basically it wiped out the Dynan update. So what the good software companies do is when there is a factory update to something for a recall or a campaign, they go in and they re-update their software to encompass it if they can. Um, otherwise, that's that asterisk that you always have to inform the customer. Yeah, I can put this software in, you're going to get 50 more horsepower, but if there's ever a campaign or a recall, we can't install it because then you're going to get, you're going to lose all that. 
So it's the rock and a hard place of selling them the product. Um, Jesse, Cat Cat Five uses only uses two pairs of the four. Yeah, I know there's only communication over a couple of them and the twisted pairs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, we don't we don't use the five or six wires that are in there. We're only communicating over the two in the vehicle. All right, so that's all I see in there for now. So let's head back into the fun here. So why is programming necessary? Well. It's what allows the module to operate. Remember, I said it's basically a dumb box until you tell it what to do, how to do it, and what it is. So I've got to have that programming for it to operate correctly. It's going to correct errors in the software or, or the code, uh, hopefully. And sometimes they fix this error and create another one and then fix it again. Uh, we may add features. So this little screenshot's out of a, a Tesla, and this is right off, the, right off the customer's screen in their car, and they were making improvements to sentry mode, and they added Joe mode, <laughs> the names they come up with, uh, to reduce the volume of your car's chimes. And then they had some update improvements and application launchers and all these kind of things. So in that case, they weren't necessarily installing a new feature, except for the Joe mode, they were mostly repairing things and stuff like that, continuous improvement. So that kind of gives you an example of both. We're fixing stuff and we're adding stuff. So that's not an uncommon thing. What's the difference between programming and encoding? Well, I kind of mentioned that. Programming is installing the book of rules, what to do and when to do it and how to do it, okay? Whereas encoding, Vehicle specifics, okay, vehicle specifics. Think of it that way. Can it run without either one? No, not correctly. It's got to have both. I got to know what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And I got to know what I'm doing it in. Without that information, I'm not going to work right. Who writes this stuff? Well, you know, a long time ago, it was those creepy people in the dark, you know, living on Jolt Cola all night long all by themselves. And a lot of them aren't that different still. No, it, it's programmers or, you know, software engineers, things like that. And they literally sit down and they write, you know, these one line sentences all day long. And, you know, for a vehicle to work, you're talking millions and millions of lines of code in that vehicle across all these different modules for them to do all the things we do. I mean, think about just for the engine management, all the stuff that has to happen, setting the fuel, setting the spark, setting the throttle, setting, you know, cam timing and, and all these other things. And that's just, just one little snippet of a microsecond. And oh, you want the windows to go up, you want the windows to go down, you want the seat to vibrate, you, you know, all these kind of things. <laughs> Good line, Robin. We call in robotics, we call them wizards. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're their own animal. Um, a lot of us got to tour, oh God, what was the name of the place? Um, something seven, Pam will remember. Um, Sector seven now, wasn't that? But uh, it was uh, one of the autonomous companies and they had like six technicians doing stuff on cars and about a hundred people writing code. That's kind of gives you an idea what like an autonomous is. It's, it's software heavy. It's not so much hardware. Hardware is off the shelf. It's the software that makes that happen. So we've got people that write it for a living. Typically technicians are not writing it. Will they in the future? Maybe someone that has a clue might be but for now, our job is to prepare the vehicle for the software installation, not so much to write the code in the first place. And again, different types of code, they're called different languages. You know, you got C plus and all these other things. Um, a lot of those are computer oriented. I don't know how, what they call the ones that are in cars. If somebody knows, they can throw it in the chat and educate us all. So preparation for programming. This is the most important thing that we're gonna talk about. Absolute most important thing. This is where things get screwed up. Update your phone and have the battery go dead. It's now a paperweight. Well, a car is a big expensive paperweight if the software doesn't work, okay? So follow the manufacturer recommendations. If you don't follow them, bad things are gonna happen. Simple as that, okay? Bad things are gonna happen. 
Now, if I'm presenting this to my students, I'm reading every line of this. I'm reading, I'm making them read every line of this. Now, this is a generic. Different manufacturers have different little tweaks and twists to it, but this is a very generic based vehicle preparation. So again, done by the technician. It starts out with, you've done all your diagnosis, you've done your repairs, and you've cleared fault memory. Okay, and part of that repair process, maybe you replaced a module, or part of that process tells you you need to update software, whatever the case may be. That's why we're doing it. We're going to save personalizations. And this was a bigger issue early on in programming. It's less of an issue now. In a lot of cases, they've brought in into the software itself where it will go in, capture and save those customers' personalizations. So their radio stations, their clock, their dates, where they left their seat, where they left their steering wheel, all those things will be saved ahead of time. You need to make sure you have a battery charger on and it's not really a battery charger, it's more power supply. On a lot of older cars, you can get away with less than 50 amps. On most of the new cars, and when I say new car, I would say like 2010 and later, you need to see 80 plus amps continuous because you get some of these cars when they wake up and they turn everything on, you might see a hundred amp draw for a little bit when it wakes the whole car up. You can't afford to have the battery voltage go down while you're programming, okay? Ignition switch needs to be in its correct state and they will tell you it's typically key on engine off, but where that gets a little weird for us is so many of these cars today with the push button starts, you can go and push button start and put it into what we would call key on engine off. And if you don't do anything for a couple of seconds, the key turns itself back off or it goes from in, uh, uh, engine on or key, engine off key on to an accessory mode. Well, it's not going to program in an accessory mode. So you've got to be very careful of the status of that key and making sure that the system stays key on engine off. All right. And typically what happens once the computers are communicating, the system will usually stay in that mode. All right. Engine and transmission temperatures need to be in a required specific range. Coolant temp, they're less concerned about, but transmission temp is huge because a lot of modern transmissions, drive-by wire, computer controlled transmissions, where's the computer? It's in the transmission. So if the guy just got done getting off the freeway from driving up from LA, that computer is smoking hot. The last thing it wants is to have its brain erased and rewritten. So they'll make you wait until you hit a certain temperature of transmission temperature, coolant temperature, things like that. Obstructions to doors, windows, sunroof, and et cetera. A lot of the programs as part of it will automatically go in and start doing initialization. So like the one touch windows, it has to relearn how to one touch. So it will go in and actually perform that initialization. So it's not uncommon on a car while you're programming to see the lights turn on and off, turn the radio, have the radio go on and off, the windows go up and down. I've seen the wipers go on and off. And that's an, an especial one to remember. With a lot of computer controlled cars, there are some systems that are default on. And wipers are one of those systems in a lot of cars where the wipers are hot wired in a way that they are on, they're commanded off. So if you go in there and you unplug the computer that controls the wipers, the wipers stay on. If you have a bus fault and that computer can't talk and tell them to turn off, the wipers stay on. Well, when we go to program, essentially what we're doing is we're going in there, we're taking that module offline, we're erasing its memory and putting new, new program in it. Well, the whole time it's there, it's not controlling things. Every other module in the car is yelling at it, hey, where are you, where are you, where are you? So everybody's setting faults. And at the same time, those wipers are going crazy. So keep that in mind, things can operate while it's programming. Vehicle must be located in an area that it can be left untouched until it's done. If somebody goes over and opens a door, opens a trunk, closes a hood, 
that can screw up the programming process. If they disconnected, God forbid, the cables or the battery charger went dead or anything like that, it can be a problem. Okay, so we've got to be mindful of all that. And I see Tom down there, he's doing calisthenics and stuff. I don't know if he's trying to get my attention or not. <laughs> um, let's see here, where we leave off. Uh, the applicable connection to the vehicle must be made and or the device. If you know the car is going to initialize the windows, I can't have the cable running through the window. It's going to pinch and it won't initialize correctly. So usually I'll run it underneath the door and I'll trip the latch so the door thinks, the car thinks the door is closed. And if I've got a window frame, it can run the initialization, no problem. But what if it's like a coupe or a convertible? It recognizes the in limits when it runs into something, the roof. So if I've got the door open, that window won't initialize correctly, I'll have to do that afterwards. So being aware of where the cables are comes into play. I need to activate the programming process however the manufacturer says to do it. All right, so they're gonna tell you the very specific way to go through that process to install it. And this is even through the third party stuff. You're still pulling down the Ford stuff to install into that Ford car. Confirmation of programming completion. When it's all done, these systems are you gonna, usually gonna give you some sort of a confirmation of what it did, how it did it, whatever the case may be. It may give you little check boxes saying completed or a red X saying when it didn't. At the very least, you're usually gonna see something like a change in the software level. Okay, so that you'll have an idea of, okay, it did the programming and yes, it worked or it didn't work. It, it sensed it as being complete or not complete. Okay, so again, this is a generic uh, sequence of setting up a vehicle for programming. And most of the cars are very similar to this. So that's on a hardwire, how we would normally do it. Now, some cars have over the air and it's very limited right now, but guess what? Almost every new car is gonna have some aspect of this going forward. It's just a matter of what systems they're gonna allow it to happen to. So Tesla's very big on it. Some of the new Jags, everybody's bringing this in. It may just be for entertainment things, or it may be vehicle operation things. So over the air stuff, it's usually not done by the technician. It's typically done automatically when the car's asleep, not in use, or by a customer prompt. So they'll get in the car, they'll have a prompt that says, hey, there's a software update, it's gonna take 10 minutes, do you wanna do it now? And you say yes or no. It's kind of like delaying updates on your phone or on your PC at home. It will then download it if it hasn't automatically downloaded. And then the installation will happen upon your request or based on the timeline set. It's going to require a certain level of battery charge. So typically with the EVs, if the battery rate's high enough, it'll do it. If it's not high enough, it'll tell you, hey, you have to be plugged in. With gasoline cars, and this is why we're just starting to see this come in, batteries are already a little challenged. And so it's going to be very particular about when it does an over-the-air update with a you know, standard non-hybrid vehicle because we don't have all that extra battery. Software updates, and I'll speak from the level that I know, and I'll just look at Mike Hernandez's head shake, yes or no. <laughs> um, most of the time, what we see with these over-the-air updates are not complete erase and reprograms. So where usually when you reprogram a car, it goes in there and wipes that module and rewrites everything. A lot of the over the air stuff is going in there and just making a correction. So it may just add it to the end and have a little hyperlink in the code that says, when you get here, look over here, versus erasing and rewriting. It's safer to do a patch than it is a wipe, and especially in an over the air. So I'm looking for Mike's head to shake. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, right now, they're about the, the big ones doing this on, a, on an aggressive level. So that's the second way. So we got hardwired to the vehicle. We've got over the air. The third way is USB. And this can be 
done in the shop, depending on what it is, or it might be done by the customer. Uh, Mykea, they had a, an upgrade to add Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And you went to their website and you pulled the software down on a USB and, and you plugged it into the drive and you had the car, you know, key off engine on and or <laughs> key on engine off and just let it sit there. And, you know, an hour or two later, it loaded that, that functionality into the system. So it's typically related to entertainment, phone, or navigation, but ultimately they could do anything they wanted with this, depending on how their bus structure and, and their approvals are to do it. Now the technician or the customer might do it. And essentially, like I said, the software comes down into a thumb drive and usually those thumb drives need to be clear. Oftentimes you might have to reformat first. You don't want anything else on there. You don't want your music and your pictures on there. It's just that program because the system has to go find a very specific file. And if it can't find it, it may not do it. So key on engine off, fully charged battery. You're following whatever screen prompts there are. And then the system at that point loads it up and then we'll do the installation. It may take minutes, it may take hours. It just depends on what it's trying to do. And it may have some post installation prompts. And again, we see this on the technician side, you know, the initialization of windows, maybe putting back in those personalizations, things like that. So with these, it could be the same thing where they tell the customer, hey, put the car out with an unobstructed view of the sky so that it can pick up the satellites and recalibrate and things like that. So you just got to follow all those directions. And more importantly, the customer has to follow all those directions if they're the ones uh, doing that function. All right. Post programming. So you've installed the software. First thing we got to do, confirm that the software or the, num the software number or the software level changed. So what we're seeing now more and more on cars, yes, every single module has its own software. Well, if you got 20 or 30 modules in that car, that means you now have to go interrogate 20 or 30 modules to confirm their software level. What the, a lot of the factory tools will do is they'll go in there and they'll do that interrogation but they'll use another term. And the term BMW used was something called integration level. And basically what integration level was, was kind of an overarching overall program level. It basically said, if I'm at this level, everything under me is okay. But if I'm at another level, what can happen is, is I might lose communication. So let's say, I program module A and I don't program module B. Module A is now up to date, but because I didn't program module B, it might not be able to talk to module A anymore. So in some cases, I might be programming module A because of a problem, but I have to program module B to maintain functionalities. So that's where that integration level comes into play. The, the, the software can look at the whole vehicle, look at all the individual softwares and say, yes, these are all compatible with each other and we only need to program this guy. But if it looks at the vehicle and it says, no, we got to program this guy, but these other guys won't work anymore, we have to program them as well. So what you see on most new cars is not as so much of I'm going in and programming one module. I'm not going to go in and just program the DM, the engine management because I did a change or a repair. I might end up programming 10 different modules on that car to make sure they can all still talk to each other and communicate with each other. And back to real earlier when we said sometimes it's a hardware that I might have to replace because it doesn't have the capacity to update. I might have to replace an unrelated module to program the module related to the repair. It's just the, the ins and outs with software and hardware, okay? So I've got to confirm that those levels came up. I've got to confirm the operation of the systems. I've got to perform whatever initializations and calibrations. So think the one touch on the windows. Restore the personalizations for the customer if the system didn't do it automatically. And then I usually need to clear fault memory. Now, some of the programs will do this for me automatically, some will not. You're thinking, well, why do I have faults? Well, 
as I take a computer off, they can't talk to each other anymore. So they set faults. I can't talk to Bob anymore. I set a fault. Everybody that tries to talk to Bob will set a fault. So now if the system as part of the programming doesn't clear all those faults, you have to go back in afterwards and clear all those faults. Otherwise, this car is going to have thousands of faults for communications because you just took one guy offline. Okay. A lot of stuff, huh? And any little thing just blows the whole thing up. Programming problems. That big red brick's there for a reason. If uh, something goes wrong in a programming, it doesn't work anymore, which means it's as good as a brick. So in some cases, programming may fail. And if that's the case, sometimes I can rerun the programming and get the module to come back. Sometimes I might have to replace that module. There's no getting it back if it loses certain aspects of the software. And in some cases, the factory field personnel can actually go through back doors, either remotely or physically at the vehicle, to where they can go in and drop in a small packet or wake up uh, through a method that we can't and get that module back up enough to have software being installed and then allow the process to continue. So you might be replacing the module, you might be just redoing the software, or you might be trying to get somebody to sneak you in the back door. But those are all things that can happen. And a lot of the time it's simple stuff that can cause that. So what are some of the possible causes of programming failures? Well, incorrect vehicle preparation. That's the number one. You didn't do the repairs. Maybe the module was bad and you didn't replace the module before you tried to reprogram it. Um, the programming was, inter it was interrupted. So somebody started using the computer, somebody opened the door and woke the car up. The shop network failed. You had an internet interruption, a connection loss, all of those things that crashes in the middle of a Zoom meeting, that can happen while it's programming a car, okay? The battery charge is insufficient. Vehicle conditions, it was too hot when I programmed. I didn't have the ignition switch in the right position. A vehicle system might have been turned on. That's one of the other things that when you set up the car, typically it'll tell you to turn the climate off, turn the radio off, turn the headlights off, have all the doors closed. If the hood's open to charge the battery, they tell you to trip the hood switches so the car thinks it's closed. So an incorrect state. Impro improper connection setup. You don't have the OBD2 in right, or if it had a most bus, you didn't have that connected incorrectly for it to program. Maybe it's flat out the wrong software. Maybe the software was corrupted. Maybe the thumb drive that you put it on was corrupted. All of those are possibles for creating problems with your programming. So if you're sitting there going, wow, there's a lot of little details to this. Yes, a lot of little details, a lot of very specific, important steps. You can't jump around them. You can't short them because if you do, it's not going to work. If you're lucky, you just reprogram it. If you're unlucky, you're now buying hardware. That's when it gets expensive. Or maybe you're buying multiple hardwares. And that brings up a question. Do we program one module at a time or multiples? Typically, it's one module at a time. You do have some systems that are capable of doing multiple modules over different networks but a lot of the time it's one at a time so that we have less chance of crashing the whole car. Maybe we just kill one thing at a time. All right, so let's see what we got in here. This is, this'll be good. Okay. Uh, and you guys got talking about this one, that was good. So there's the stasis stuff, cat, robotics. Here we go, Ruben. Uh, way back in the 80s at GM, we changed out the prom to eliminate the math input and revert to speed density. Yeah, uh, transmission modules were the, the, the last ones to hold on to EEPROMs, it seems like. Uh, engine management went away, went to the EEPROMs, and then eventually transmissions did. Um, 
heads posts and stuff. The great robot race. Yeah, uh, the DARPA races have driven technology. That's the driving force between, uh, behind autonomous vehicles. DARPA is the reason that LIDAR exists. The guy that created LIDAR created LIDAR to go win DARPA. Uh, Henry Chan, newer vehicle will automatically know if the ECU programming has been changed and then restored back to factory. Example, if you buy a performance car, put a performance flash in it and blow it up, the ECU program will log that and change your forward your Yeah, and I think that's very dependent on the manufacturer. Um, some will hold a lot of information like that and some might not. And uh, yeah. Uh, Mark said, like Windows Update, yeah, a lot of the time you are seeing histories. Uh, did he kill Kenny? Only if he didn't program and set it up right. Uh, Mark, I had my E36 M3 reprogrammed in 02. Uh, always passes smog, uh, but did move from ultra clean to just in limits. Yeah, and that's, you know, from the programmer's side, that's a good job. It still passed. You know, you got the performance and it passed. Uh, Kalen, aftermarket or piggyback module can be damaged if not removed before programming. Yeah, I've heard that too. Um, I haven't done it, so I couldn't say on that one on that stuff. Uh, Pam remembered it was lift level five. Yes, I knew it was level something. I had seven in my head for some reason. Uh, Mark, I tried to, to zoom lecture near my hybrid and it seemed to like the magnetic interference is affecting the Wi-Fi. Oh, that's interesting. You know, there's no magnetic fields in a high voltage area. Uh, Henry, if the OIS detects something out of the ordinary, it will automatically block and flag your vehicle for referee inspection only. The referee will download the program and the bar will take closer look at the programming to compare to similar vehicles before it certifies. Yeah, and I think that's probably where they're able to identify is they're looking for comparisons. Um, because a lot of the time, you know, if the, if the guy writes a good code, they may not see it in a software number. They may have to drill down deeper and start looking at PID data and make comparisons to say, oh, how come that's there and that's there? And I know that they were talking about that ability to really draw down and compare like with like. Uh, Mark, at the Audi dealer, when we scanned a vehicle, it would scan all modules, and if a flaw in programming was detected, it would ask if you wanted to fix the programming, thus eliminating any of the aftermarket program. Uh, it knew what software every vehicle had by the VIN. Yes, on the later cars, we were seeing that too, where it knew at the manufacturer level what that car had in it at any given time for software. So if you did go in and change something outside of the BMW network, it didn't jive with what the BMW system had and you started, it suspected, yeah, you've had an aftermarket flash. But that's been, you know, on the more recent side, you know, I'd say within the last five to eight years. A little before that, it didn't really track on the back side that way. Um, they've done that since, I think just for a lot of reasons, including, you know, ongoing testing. Uh, Mark, remember when Cadillac would disable AC if a check engine light was left unattended too long? Yeah, that'd make a customer pretty miserable. Uh, I had a weird one. When we first started seeing programming in cars, I had a customer who came in and he came in complaining the AC wasn't cool. And we'd check it and service it and drive it and it would be fine. He'd come in a month later, AC's not cool. And after about the third time, we happened to start looking at the car just by a fluke, and we said, you know, he's got cross drilled rotors, he's got this, got this, and we popped the top and looked at the module, and it said, you know, so-and-so company, which was the performance company doing stuff, it was IPD that was doing stuff for Volvo, and sure enough, he had a, a reprogrammed module. Well, one of the things that they do on reprogramming for performance is you turn the AC compressor off sooner and longer, and what was happening was he drove the car like a, like a light switch. He was in the throttle so much, it turned the AC compressor off all the time. So we were nice and we told him, well, you don't have an AC problem, you have a reflash problem and you know, we're not gonna say anything, but you don't get to complain about this anymore. So you know, it just depends on how you handle your customer. We didn't install it, but uh, you know, those things come into play. And yeah, the car companies nowadays, if it gets found, yeah, they're going to pull the warranty off of whatever it's applicable. So the window regulator, it's still under warranty, but the engine, the transmission, the drive line, not anymore.
Uh, let's see here, Kalen, there's also dead flashing with key off. We've had that, and I can only speak from the BMW side, our push button ignition uh, was called the CAS. And for it to program, we had to turn the car off. So you were in the programming process and it would tell you basically turn off the car. And as soon as it recognized the car turned off, remember the network was still alive. It was being maintained alive through the programming. It would then go in there and reflash that one module and then come up and tell you, okay, turn the car back on. Then you would turn the car back on and then it would finish the programming. But it couldn't reprogram that particular module when the key was on. So maybe Kalen's talking something similar to that on, on, on those vehicles. Hey, Kirk, um, can I jump in for a second? Yes, definitely. Okay, so uh, I kind of got this from Ford engineers too. Um, basically what happens is what you were talking about. Modules uh, interfere with each other during all the programming because they're looking. So they were figuring out that some of their software wasn't going in. So they had you do it with the key off. And when the scan tool would say, turn the key on, if you would answer yes and say, are you sure you turned the key on? Yes, I did. <laughs> you just keep answering yes. And finally, it just walked over it and started putting the programming in. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the bigger things. And there's a big difference between programming with the manufacturer stuff and programming with the aftermarket. With the factory stuff, it tends to want to go in and look at everything in the car and update everything. With the aftermarket stuff, oftentimes you're buying the program just to update that one module that you're dealing with, not necessarily the whole car. So you could end up creating problems. Now, if you remember way back to the beginning when I showed that video, and they talked about only programming when directed. Here's what can happen. Some of those earlier cars, I said, they only had so many reflashes sometimes on that module before it ran out of space or it cycled too many times they didn't want to take chances. So early on, what you had is you had some cars coming in and they were, thought they were doing the customer a favor and updating their car every time the car came in. And all of a sudden it started needing modules left and right, even though there was no complaints, no problems. So most of the car companies have a very specific requirements as to when it's okay to program. So it'll be things like if it's in a service bulletin, if it's part of a recall, if it's part of a campaign, if the field engineer tells you to do it, if the repair instructions tell you to do it, if the customer has, has purchased an accessory that needs programming and then it requires other things in the car to be programmed to bring the software levels up. Those kind of things are those typically approved times and usually the manufacturer's paying those under the warranty and stuff. It's not until you try to do things individually that the systems usually push back even though you typically can, even in the factory stuff, go in and do one module, that's not the preferred method because you could create problems throughout the vehicle that way. So a little bit of stuff today. So we've got a couple more important things to talk about. That's pretty much all I've got to talk about with programming. So if you've still got stuff to throw in the chat, go ahead. But let's touch on a couple more things here. The training request stuff. Can't say this one enough. Please put stuff into the chat you know, so that, that way we can capture it while you're sitting at your computer and somewhat thinking about it. But more importantly, respond in PAM survey. The reason is this is even though the industry, well, and I'll break industry, I'll say the employers are telling him one, her telling her one thing, the OEMs are telling her something, we're telling her something, she needs to be able to compile that information and take it back into the state and the BACC to try to drive funding so that we can put these training sessions together and things like that. So that's where that is important. She needs that hard response data to take back and say, I need, I need to do this because, and here's the, the continuities, everybody's saying the same thing. You know, things that we've already talked about, hands-on training with ADAS. Uh, we'll try to get that together, if not late this semester, next semester whether it'll be at one of our campuses or it might be at a third party, don't know. Uh, we've heard more bus stuff and a lot of that's from industry, but even from some of you, um, a big conversation is what does industry need the technicians to know and do? I know our advisories tell us one thing, uh, Pam is sitting in an ASCCA, she's sitting in with the OEMs, she's sitting in with the state and everything else. She's hearing a whole nother level of stuff sometimes. 
So, you know, there's what we feel they need to know, but there's also what industry is telling us. Um, I'll tell you from experience, one of our advisories, we had Mazda sitting in there and they said, you absolutely have to be doing this, this, and this. And it was, you know, it was more about programming, more about buses, more about ADAS. You know, they, they, they were to the point, you're, you can do less of that fundamental in some cases and more of this because this is what they're going to do more than the drum brakes and stuff. So that, that kind of stuff's important. And maybe you've got something in your head floating around that isn't even on this list. Um, that's why it needs to go in the discussion. That's why it needs to go into that survey. The sooner you can turn that around, the sooner she can go chase money. That's the importance of this. Okay, the sooner you turn that around, the sooner she can chase money. Uh, there was even, her and I had a conversation before this meeting of the high school instructors giving her feedback on, on resources, online teaching resources for them. That could be something to where, you know, we can use some of, at the college level, some of our intro course materials. You know, if you're on Canvas and the high school's on Canvas, if you share those things to the commons, then they can go get that. You know, so that would be a big thing to talk about. Um, so use that information. That's really important. Uh, some other things, and I saw Don just chimed in with it, and I had it in my notes that I wanted to touch on. Just like with the ADAS stuff that we've been talking about, and I said, hey, how are you going to bring that into your classes? You know, even if it's just a little bit in the intro or something heavier, you have the access to the materials. You've got the PowerPoints. You've got the videos. You've got some awareness. There's nothing stopping you from bringing those things in. Well, programming's that same way. This is something that industry's told us for a long time. You need to talk about more, more about programming, more about programming. How many of us are really doing it? Because there's no aspect on a modern vehicle that does not add, include programming in the repairs. There's not a single system that programming doesn't come into play into the repair process. So programming should be in every subject area we have. That's, that's a big one. Um, you know, the one I've been riding the bus on for a few years is the new basics. How do we get to that next level of stuff? You know, how do we, you know, teach less carburation and more direct injection? How do we teach less drum brakes and more stability control and emergency braking systems? You know, how do we, what topics need more weight? And, and I don't think the conversation needs to go to the point, well, you spend 10 minutes on this. I don't think that's it. I think it's where do we reproportion things? You know, in an automatic transmissions class, do we, how much teardown do we need to do to versus how much more we need to do with electrical testing and diagnosing and things like that? So it's that balance and there's no one right answer, but that's a discussion that really, you know, it needs to happen because ASEs, heard about it. You know, I, we've all sat in a lot of webinars lately. We've seen it. We've heard it. The, you know, I started throwing new, deba new basics in chats all the time. And it's out there. It, the rumblings are there. Everybody knows that we need to evolve. Then they're waiting for ASE to tell us what to do. We don't have to wait for ASE to tell us what to do. We can still do it and still meet the ASE requirements with ease. So don't be afraid of that stuff. So second to the last thing from me, we have to thank Pam. I think everybody needs to reach down there, un unmute their mic and clap for this lady. Because you guys Thanks, can't Pam. imagine the amount of hours that she puts in on this stuff. Thanks, because Pam. remember, she talks to all of us, she talks to our deans, she talks to our VPs, she talks to our presidents, she talks to the regional, she talks to the state, she talks to the OEMs, she talks to all the industry groups. And, you know, she's spending stupid amount of hours trying to find ways to help our students, our programs and all of us. So that, that's huge. I know that whole lectures thing isn't very easy either. <laughs> yeah. Six proposals, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and you think about that. The elect tube's a perfect example. I know for our students, it's $70 a semester. So four times 70, we j Pam's actions just saved every one of our students $280.
And That's our, huge. Yeah, even though and our school is going to get it, even though what we're pitching in, we're still saving about over two thousand dollars on what the school is going to do for us. So she definitely saved us a whole lot of money. And I did just I feel bad for her going back and forth. Like, sorry, I have to come back now again. And like, man, that takes a lot of guts to continue to write those emails. <laughs> It's a moving target, but you know, she goes above and beyond guys. I mean, and here's the thing. Uh, I know there's some Southern California people that have been in and out of some of these. I don't think, and I may be wrong. I don't think Southern California has done anywhere near as many faculty training and project things as we've done up here in the last three years. There's been a lot of paid training for faculty, a lot of tools and equipment for colleges and high schools and all that other stuff. Um, and that's because of her hard work. So thank you, Pam. I just want to say that at this point in my life, it's important to make a contribution. And I respect and admire all the work that you guys do. My dad and mom are teachers, and I know it is not an easy pathway. It isn't. And I, feel, I find it ironic that I've circled back to actually be in education after my sojourns and other industry opportunities, but I find working with faculty, with all you guys, very satisfying. You guys are so motivated, and gals, sorry, Laura, uh, to help your students and to do what's best for them, no matter what's going on politically or financially at your own campuses. And if I can help you, that's what I want to do. And at this time with COVID, I find this a very creative time. And many of you have stepped up to make it happen during a time that is extremely difficult. So thank you for attending these sessions, for coming up with ideas and working together to make this happen because without you guys on the front lines, our students would really be having a horrible time because life is pretty tough now and I'm afraid it's gonna to get tougher. So thank, thank, thanks to all of you to making it happen for them so that they can have a better life. And that's what this is all about. Very cool. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. So that's all I got, guys. So thanks for letting me share with all of you for these nine weeks. Oh, my God. Um, Let's we'll continue come up, this. Let's we'll come up with this. some more stuff. And, and Pam and I were talking before, you know, maybe we'll do a Friday a month type of thing and, and maintain the continuities and the connections and the discussions. And, you know, when we come up with what the next training things we can be, we can build those in and however. Um, but I appreciate you guys uh, being here every week and, and the communications back and forth. And, and again, if there's anything I can do to help you, shoot me an email. I'll do what I can. Uh, the presentations and stuff are up there. Have at it. So, and all the high school yes. faculty, I'm trying to get you paid. I should know in the next week or two. I'm trying to get you paid. So hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Thanks, Kurt. Pam, thank you so much for everything you've done for this program since we first met many years ago. Ms. Kalen, you and I <laughs> went together. You were my first teammate five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I remember. Oh, that's, yeah. all I got. that's all I got for you guys. So right, enjoy Kurt, your Friday. You so it's actually thank on you. time, 2.30. Hey. Wait till the last one to make it right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank another minute. Pam, you thank you, Kurt. Enjoy your <laughs> summer. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank Have Bye a great week, semester. Pam. All right. Thank you, Kurt. Stay. Thank you, Pam. Keep up Have a good the weekend. power, Pam. <laughs> Bye, Mark. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Kurt. See Bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Kurt. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Thanks Pam, everybody. Too. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Did we do Have virtual Temecula. <laughs> it may end up being virtual Temecula. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of wine at home. <laughs> Let's have a glass, Mark. <laughs> All righty. Oh, my camera just went nutty. That's funny. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. What's Jaime doing in there? Pam, did you see my? I, I wrote you something. Mike just, I think Mike just uh, closed off. Yeah. Did he? No, I did. No, I wrote no there's something. Mike. There's Mike. Is Mike still there? Hello, Mike. Yeah, Mike's there. Sorry. He's hiding behind my participants box. <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm gonna answer your survey now, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I did great and
David, thank you for your ideas about the flyer for the independent garages and body shops. That's a you know absolutely great idea. And they're very interested in working with us. So thank you for that. Well, we have that certificate for the body shops. Yeah, cool. Getting That's the advertising those... out, getting that information out is great. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to do your survey now, Pam. Thank you. Great, Mark. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> See you, Mark. Have a good semester. All right. I'm trying to figure out how to turn this off. Go down the bottom <laughs> oh, <it> right. <laughs> bottom right. I think I know by now, huh? <laughs> See ya. Yeah, the camera all of a sudden decided to change change the outlet. You can see my green screen. <laughs> yeah, I like your ultimate pass. Is it ultimate pass, basically? I don't know. It's just something I found on the on the internet. It looked yeah, it looks, good. It looks cool. I like it. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. Cool. It looks very high tech. <laughs> the sun is rising. A new day. I like yeah, it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. There's a few of them I found that uh, I've been rotating through them and stuff. But this is the first time I've had it change. Uh, it just suddenly changed the. Uh, the resolution or something and and uh bumped it away all right so i'm gonna put these ron's last few plan. guys in the waiting room ron's got his plan there he's got a vintage ford 1939. oh wow yeah he's got it up on uh one of the lifts in the uh college of Al um college of marin shop hmm. <laughs> all right you and i'm gonna stop the recording oh gosh I forgot. <laughs> I didn't expect.